So this upcoming video is going to be basically about how to choose your seeds. Say you're brand new and you don't know how to use seeds or which ones to go buy. I'm going to take you through a little tour. They're going to be more geared for northern climates, but you'll learn some from the south too. Let's talk about seeds and then I'll make a separate video showing you how to actually plant them and how to avoid mistakes. Uh, there's a lot of mistakes you can do with seeds and we'll get to those. So it's snowing again. Uh, it snowed last night. So that's why I don't have this completely down yet. Uh, I'm waiting to put things in. I am way, way early where I live anyway to plant anything. But I wanted to get all this laid out, my potato garden, so I don't have to deal with uh, bugs and all that sort of stuff. Because uh, the hot weather and bugs putting in a garden sucks. Welcome back. I am talking to you about starting seeds today. Now, as I've said in my other videos, if you're a complete noob gardener, you really want to skip this step unless you don't have any other choice. Starting seeds can be very difficult and frustrating and take some practice to really get to do it well. I'm going to give you some tips that will accelerate it if, you know, hopefully you won't have a bunch of uh, seeds that do nothing because I that has been so frustrating. You, you plan all this, you have high hopes, they come up and then they get moldy or they dry out or a little chipmunk shows up and eats them. Like it's, it can be really frustrating to grow plantlings. So the idea is to plant a lot of them uh, and kind of be ruthless and weed out the ones you don't want. And I'm the last guy, I love plants. I, I talk and sing to my plants. I don't want to pull any of them out, but um, with seedlings you kind of have to be ruthless, it sucks. So you're going to plant more than you need because a lot of them are going to go with attrition. That being said, maybe you're an intermediate gardener or you're a beginner that you just can't, you have seeds and you can't get plants because they're sold out right now in the stores. And like I did that story that some uh, garden places are now being called non-essential and they're just shutting them down. You just can't get plants. So we're going to do the best what we got. Some of this you're going to have to plan ahead, but depending on where you live. Now, I'm way up north in the White Mountains. My growing season is very short. So what happens is I have to start a lot of this stuff inside, get it in the ground. Some of you guys that watch this are in other parts of the world or down south. And you can direct sow right into the soil. You don't have to do what I'm doing with trays and stuff. So if you can do that, man, do it. Everything is always better direct sowed usually. I mean, unless they're super fragile plants and die easy, but almost everything else is, is better just in the ground where it's going to be. It doesn't take the transplant shock. First thing we got to do, though, is let's take a look at our zone. You're probably like, what's a zone? If you're a new gardener and you don't know what a zone is, the country is actually split up the world to different zones. I live up in the White Mountains, so I'm in zone 4A. So let me show you that, what I can grow and what I can't. You're going to look up something on the internet called a uh, uh, gardening guide for your zone. All right, so let's talk about our gardening guide. Uh, for you guys that maybe live in other countries and you don't know all the states and something, I'm way up here, right next to Canada, the Canadians, eh? So we're pretty polite too, but not as polite as Canada. Shout out to Jordy Johnson. There you go. <laughs> anyway. So what I'm doing is, I'm looking, this is for zone 4A, this is what I need to plant. The different colors here mean different things. Green means you started inside, and uh, I think this is yellow, or tan or something in the middle. That means you uh, plant it into the ground, and the red's kind of when you want to start harvesting. So you'll see that nothing's really exact because you have to base it on how the weather is. So these are about. So if I want to do beets, I should start them sometime in the middle of April uh, inside and then put them in the ground at the beginning of May. They'll be ready by the end of June, hopefully. So this is kind of a ballpark that will help get you through depending on the weather. You can cheat this forward or you might have to push it back. So I have to decide. I don't have a whole lot of room. I'm going to go for some basics, but most of my gardening, my intensive gardening is going to be potatoes. But I'm going to do some beans on the outside, and then I need some greens and um, high-producing, uh, maybe some like zucchini or peppers, something like that, just to have uh, some more nutrients in my diet. 
The other thing is I am going to try to grow a few root vegetables like kohlrabi. Maybe some carrots. They're not ideal because they take up a lot of room, but I'm going to show you a hack with that hopefully. So here we go. Let's pick some seeds out. I know you're saying to yourself, but Taryn, wait. I'm looking at a farmer's almanac and it counterdicts that other chart. And you're right, because here like, it shows that beans don't even get planted indoors. You should just put them outside. So what you're going to do usually is go with what the package says, because there will be some discrepancies. But in this situation, you're going to see me talk about picking seeds. And I will talk about um, planting both ways. I'm going to sow stuff directly in the ground, and I'm going to start stuff inside to see if I can get an early jump. Stuff that normally doesn't get started. Things like, you know, uh, beans and, and uh, beets and stuff like that. Normally, they don't transplant that well. But since I have so many seeds, I'm going to gamble it and try. If you don't have much seeds, I would say follow what's actually on the bag. I'm also going to use the lunar cycle on here. I'm old school and my grandfather taught me using the moon so that's what I'm going to use over the frost date. I prefer the moon seems to work a little better I think than just a hard frost date. So we're going to talk a little about beans because some you will start indoors especially if you're in the north. Uh, some you will just put directly they call it direct sow. So I'm going to talk to you like you've never planted seeds before so stick with me. Um, if you've never done seeds what happens is seeds have to be uh, stored in kind of a cooler environment in the dark. You don't want to start them going into bags and I usually put mine in bags like here's just some a few piles of seeds I have um, and I've got different kinds. So let me explain you the difference here. These are what I call ghetto seeds where these are the stuff you buy at the Dollar General for you know two for a dollar and what I usually do is I wait till September and these things go on sale they get marked down to five or ten cents a pack so I was literally buying ten packs of these things for a buck so I kinda of bought these as an emergency seeds and now I'm glad we did and these are the kind of things I'd probably end up just giving to my neighbors if they needed seeds and it's good to be a good neighbor um, they will grow you will get a lot less germination out of them. So when you buy these things, you might get half the seeds to germinate, you know, maybe a little higher. But the higher quality seeds you go, they test them for germination and they get better and better. So this is the next level. These are usually brands of, uh, all these are green beans right now that I'm showing you. And these are summer organic but not necessarily heirloom. Like this guy here, I'm pretty sure it's a pretty good company, but it's not an heirloom. Uh, I'm going to try to grow the yard long. I've never done that. I'm not sure. I'm playing with some ideas here, but this really isn't the time to be experimenting. I should just go with the tried and true. So I go down here to the bottom row here, and these are all heirlooms. And I like to spray in Olds, get these at Agway. And when I, I usually buy stuff from... Uh, Baker Creek. And this is their catalog here. Rareseeds.com. But they are impossible to buy from right now. So I'm going with my backups here. So what's going to happen is I've got different beans. And let me tell you about beans. There's basically three varieties. There's what's called a bush bean where this bush might grow a foot or two and you go and you just pick them off a bush. They have pole beans which they the beans wind up a bowl, pole and you kind of know that from the the children's stories of Jack and the Beanstalk and stuff like that. They'll just keep growing and growing and growing and you need to put support for them to climb. Then you have something called runner beans, which I don't have any because I don't have enough room. And they just kind of run all over the ground. They don't climb up a pole. Um, I'm not screwing with runner beans. Bush beans are the easiest and most successful. And if you're a new gardener, it's probably where you want to go. Uh, I might do one pole bean because it's kind of fun to have yard long beans but I, I don't know we'll see what kind of room I got what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna focus on since this is kinda of more of an emergency situation heirlooms If you don't know what that means heirlooms are seeds that are unscrewed with um, that you can grow you can grow these to uh, their full life cycle and then collect the beans 
and then grow them again. So literally, and I'm not joking, this bag will be perpetual for as long as I save seeds and barring nothing goes wrong with like disease or something. I can just keep harvesting these over and over and keeping my own seeds. And you'll see I do harvest stuff I like and keep my own seeds. So there you go about beans. Now, if you don't know much about it, lucky for you, they have instructions on the back. How to space them, how far to put them down, how much sun to give them. Um, and we'll just combine that with a chart of when to start them, and we're good to go. The beans are for, if you're up north, the beans that seem to work the best um, is you're going to go with the old school provider beans. Let's see, do I have providers here? I have contenders. Those are close. Contenders, uh, the Blue Lake, the Royal Burgundy. This is kind of just more for a treat. I don't know how great that's going to grow, but we're going to give it a whirl. But the uh, if you can find them, those are good. Something else I forgot to mention. When you have stuff like black beans um, or the, the dried beans that you buy, that's a whole different kind of bean you're going to grow. Green beans, you're pretty much going to have to either freeze or can or just eat a ton of them. Um, the other kind of beans don't produce as much. These green beans, the more you pick them, the more they produce. They will just keep giving you tons of food for a little, little space. The dried beans, you gotta kind of have to let them go to seed, and they don't produce as much. But you can dry them, and they store really well. And those are things like, uh, when I was a kid, soldier beans were really big. But you don't see them sold in stores anymore. You pretty much have to order those. I can't even get them at the local Agway. So, there is talk and I've never done it but supposedly you can grow some of the beans the dried beans that you buy in a store are actually viable they hey if they come overseas they've probably been irradiated and they can't but if they're from the US you might be able to grow with them so I'm gonna grab a tray and just try to grow some black beans uh, just to see if I can or maybe one of those 12 green bean variety things and just put them all on a tray and see what comes up so if you're really desperate, you can try some, and I've heard that that can happen, but I've never done it. Okay, so let's uh, get to planting. We're going to start some beans. So these are the beans I'm going to go with. Uh, the one thing I forgot to mention is, because I'm kind of worried about the situation, I'm going to try a, a stunt pair. And basically the wood chips allow me to grow much earlier in the season. So I'll put these in my potato patch. And they will, the wood chips will keep these things warm when they should freeze and die. Now, if there's a frost, I'll probably have to cover them. But I might be able to squeak an extra few weeks ahead. And what you will do is plant uh, successively. So you can put new ones of these out about every two weeks if you really want to blow up your beans and grow a lot. You can just keep adding more to the garden every two weeks. And you will just get a parade of beans. I mean, these things... There's a reason they're the most popular food in the world. They grow well. And this variety, again, are these are the ones you want to use if you're up north in cold climates like Canada or Michigan or just anywhere. Now, they'll work in the south. They're heat tolerant, but really ask your local uh, seed store. Go to somewhere like Agway. Don't go to like a Walmart where the, the guy has no idea what they're talking about. Go somewhere where they know about seeds, a local hardware store or a gardening club or something, and find out what's good around your area. And here's what I'm saying. It's telling me not to even put start beans inside till the beginning of June. And normally I would stick to this pretty good. But because I have wood chips, I can cheat it into May. And so I can, I'm actually in the middle of April now. It's about uh, most, I think it's about the middle of April. Um, so I might wait a week or two to start the beans so they start growing indoors in May and, and, and jump start it up a few weeks. I have so many beans that I'm willing to try a, a, like I said, a stunt bean to see if I can sneak a little extra growing time in. If not, they die and I got a lot more beans, so I'm not too worried about it. So these are some of the vegetables I'm looking at putting in, and I want to explain why. Um, what I'm going to look at here is... I like um, kilrabi, and if you've never had it, you basically just cut it up and almost use it like a, a potato. I just use it like in stir fries, you just cut them down. But what's cool about the kilrabi, and a lot of people don't do this, but I do, is I'll eat the greens too. So you can eat the actual uh, fruit of it in the green, the globe. But look how fast it comes up. Two months and you basically 
have something the size of a, you know, they're, they're similar to turnips. If you've never had a kill Robbie. Now, turnips, um, they grow very fast too. Within two months, you're almost ready to harvest. And I mean, these are smaller turnips, but they're, I think I have a large one too. Like you can get the large globe ones. It takes a little longer. But I'm going with stuff that's high speed and produces food. No, this is 55 days too. So, all right. Um, but king of the house here is radish. Look how fast they mature. 25 days. Under a month, you can have little radishes. Now, radishes are something... Um, I don't particularly even like radishes unless they're really small and they haven't gotten too peppery. But some people really like pepper, and uh, that's the way to go. Now, carrots usually aren't a very good choice for like a survival garden because they take up a lot of room. But these little fingerling carrots are super easy to grow, and you can grow them inside in a, um, in a tray or a container because there's and they mature really fast. So I'm gonna probably cram a bunch of finger carrots together, and uh, for you guys that want to grow stuff inside. This is a great choice. You can just do it in a little tray and they mature pretty quick. This is a very, very underestimated and what a lot of people forget because very few people eat beets. Uh, they love the color, the way it looks, but they say it tastes too woody. And the deal with beets is you don't ever really want to eat them big. You want to eat them like the size of a lemon or a golf ball. Maybe a golf ball is more accurate. And they're not woody. And what's cool about the beet is it's like getting three... Uh, plants in one. You get the beet, the root, um, the stalk looks like celery. You can cut it up and use it like celery. And if you catch the leaves before they get too big, um, they're very tender and you can throw them in a salad. If they get big, you got to treat them like kale. You'd like cook them down so they wouldn't be so bitter. Uh, I'm going to grow beets because they're like an awesome survival food. That and kilrabi. People really underestimate those. And these guys grow so fast that I could get multiple you know, um, especially you'll see a lot of third world countries up north, like uh, in Russia's and parts of like Siberia. Not, not that Russia's third world, but parts of it are. Um, you can, uh, they grow turnips like crazy because they're super fast and you can get a lot of bang for the buck. It's a little early to start my squash. If I look at my calendar, I need to wait. So I probably won't be starting my squash. Or, and, you know, a lot of people forget that this is called zucchini squash. They're also squash, so you just kind of, squash and zucchini are pretty much the same. You just want to start those a little later. So I'm going to uh, start with these guys and, and get them ready. Let's see. Look how fast beets go. I put them in mid-April, and by end of June, I'm already there. So this is nothing. I mean, that is so fast, and I can go and plant them again. Um, I'm going to figure out a recipe, find a way to like beets. Because they are really good bang for the buck. Now, I have never grown rutabaga. But supposedly, you can use them just like potatoes. And you cook them down. Oh, uh, yeah, it even says that. Use like potatoes. Pretty much tastes like potatoes. So, they're like potatoes that mature in half the time. I think they're 90 days. Uh, regular potatoes are f five months, so 20 weeks. Uh, these guys almost act like a potato, and you can grow them really quick. I mean, it won't taste exactly like it, but pretty sure you you know it's close enough so this is kind of the root vegetables I'm gonna go with and then I'll grow some green leafies and eventually I'm gonna grow hopefully a ton of squash but sometimes squash has can be tough to grow there's a lot of bugs uh, especially down south I used to have real problems with uh, the kind of bugs that bore into the the vine of it the, and uh, that's that's a whole different animal but the idea to get around bugs is you plant and then plant two weeks later and plant again so usually if the bugs kill one section they've already matured and flown off and done something else and they might take out a piece of your your uh, grow but not all of it so there we go this is what we're rolling with here's the next set of stuff going in now you're gonna say hey you need pollinators and you're right I do like pollinators um, in New Hampshire lupins grow really well excellent pollinator but they're pretty much done early I probably already missed this but I'm gonna to try to stick some in late if I can get them in there I grow mammoth sunflowers just because they're fun and uh, I know some people eat sunflower seeds but I actually leave these up for the birds 
And the reasoning is the birds pick at these and leave my regular stuff alone. I kind of bribe the birds, but I actually try to attract birds to the yard. I know that's opposite than a lot of people, but what I noticed is when I have a lot of birds, I don't have many um, bugs and slugs and stuff. They come and eat all that junk. So I attract them to the yard. I bribe them with seeds, bird seeds, and they usually like eat the bird seed and they'll pick off some caterpillars or worms for you. Marigolds are really good uh, to put in the garden, and I put them almost in every bed, probably one or two in every bed. I just shove them in there because they, they keep a lot of pests out. There's a lot of things that don't like marigolds, um, but the pollinators do like them, so they'll come in there. And I gotta have catnip for my cat, or he will protest and eat all my stuff. Gotta take care of your pets, guys. Now, peas are a weird animal. Peas actually like cold weather, so you can put these in the ground pretty much. Some people, some packages will say, you know, put them in the ground before the first frost. Some will say you can put them in as soon as you can work the soil, which means there's frost on the ground. And some will say to wait. So you just kind of have to read. And a lot of times you don't put peas um, in containers and start them. But I might. I might try it and see what happens. I'll probably direct sow most of these and then put a few in pots just to see what, uh, which way it works. Because It'd be nice to be able to jump start them, and I like to have a little security in case everything dies from a, a frost. Early springs, even though they seem like they're awesome, they actually kind of stink because you'll get a false security, things will start coming up, and then one or two cold nights will come and just kill everything that's starting and you'll lose stuff. Like uh, one of my cherry trees didn't even produce yet uh, because it started blooming and then we got a frost that wiped everything out. Okay, so let's go to the, uh, the greens. Alright, things we definitely can start are sweet peppers. Um, bunching onions, you know, once you put them in the ground, I try to buy, you know, perennials where like chives and bunching onions, they will go year after year. Actually, I don't even eat my bunching onions probably for a year or two. I've got a wonderful patch that I've grown from uh, kitchen scraps that I left alone for a few years and now they're kicking, they're awesome. Uh, my tomatoes, if you watched my how to save tomato seed videos, this is my purple Cherokee. So I'm going to grow these heirloom poop. These are the ones I saved from uh, my plant last year. And because I have access to my aeroponics here, these tomatoes are growing here. And I will just take some clippings from this guy and propagate them right into the ground. So we will uh, use what I have available and get a, a jump start with those cherry tomatoes. What a lot of people don't... Um, and I haven't grown these before, but I'm looking forward to it, are the husk cherries, uh, or ground cherries, tomatoes. And you grow these just like tom tomatoes, but what's interesting is they have a husk, and you, after you pick them, you'll let them sit for about two weeks before they become sweet. Otherwise, they're a little bitter. It takes them a while to get... But what's interesting is if you leave them in their husk, these things will store for months. Uh, you can have a tomato-like thing, you know, months later, and it will stay good until you pop it out of its husk. So, pretty good for, uh, you know, long-term growth if you want fresh tomatoes. Okay, so we still got the kale to do and the spinach. And we'll talk about those. Alright, so here's my leafy greens, what I'm going to be going with. The thing I eat the most and I like is bib lettuce. I really like bib lettuce, so I'll probably plant this all over the place. Um, Swiss chard is really good because it's so it grows so fast and so easy and so big. You look like like an expert farmer, and uh, it can be a little bitter. You gotta you gotta cut it up, and uh, I usually use this for soups and stir fry kind of things. I rarely eat chard raw. This is uh, oh spinach. Uh, I like this kind of spinach. It grows pretty good, and this is something called deer tongue. So deer tongue lettuce is a little weird because it's actually um, really good in heat. Oh, and it says it right here, slow to go to seed. So this is the kind of thing you would pick at late in the high temperatures of the summer. This thing can take serious heat. So if you're down in Texas or somewhere in the south, deer tongue's a really good way to go. Blue kale, uh, again, this Baker Creek. I love these guys. This stuff is tough. If you live up north, my kale was growing. I was going out and picking it out of the snow. And you'll see that in my garden I had a few stalks survive that are already growing. 
So I'm just hopefully get a second year out of the same plant. Oh, uh, let's see. Collard greens, they're more southern. You got to kind of grow these in the heat, but you can start these inside. I haven't decided if I want to do these or not, but the reason they're here is because they're incredibly nutritious. They're good uh, to juice, but a lot of people in the South use this in soups and they uh, stir fry it down with a bunch of grease, which isn't healthy, but whatever. That's how they eat them. And then uh, kale. Now, I'm a huge fan of kale. you got to find a kale you like. The purple stuff's supposed to have, anything with a purple color usually has a, a little more vitamins in it, they say. I don't know if that's true or not, but it is pretty, and I like it. Um, and that's why you'll see my cabbage is also purple. Now, I'll grow a little cabbage, but I don't prefer head cabbage. It, it, it takes a while. I mean, I'll grow some and pick at it, but I'm not going to really survive a lot on a... I'm not going to put a lot of concentration on cabbage for that. Now, what I might do... I have almost no room, so corn's usually a bad decision. But, it's baby corn. So, it's ready really fast. You're going to eat this thing when it's small, and you can do it a few times. And if you do baby corns, you can put them... Corn always has to be planted in a square. You never want to plant corn just in a straight row. They don't pollinate. You want to put them in at least like in a 3x3 three three square. Um, I might, if I have enough room, do just a little baby corn. Just to, I mean, obviously you're not going to get a lot of food out of baby corn. These are like the little ones you put on a salad. But they're kind of fun to grow. But what you can do is run beans up their corn stalks. So I might use them that way as kind of for their stalk. And Last time I grew these, uh, you'll see a video where I grew these, and they're very successful, pretty easy to grow, but the uh, raccoons really like them, so you got to deal with raccoons. If you live in cold weather, uh, one thing you want to know is pretty much that anything that sounds like it's up north, that's going to be a good kale to grow. Uh, Russian or Siberian, this is good kale. The problem with this one, though, is it is right here. It says don't even use it for food. Now, they're talking about the seeds. Um, you can grow them and that stuff will break off. But still, it's not heirloom. You won't be able to harvest seeds. This is like so cheap though. Uh, what is it? Like three bucks for a whole lot of seeds. Um, so this is a much cheaper way to go with kale. It'll be fine if you want to use it for the season. But... Again, I'm not crazy about this right here. I prefer an emergency situation that you grow food that you can just keep growing and growing. But, you know, if you have neighbors that uh, you want to be nice and they ha absolutely have no seeds, they'll probably be happy to get something like this. As far as if you have shade in your garden, you're like, man, I have a love to grow, but I don't get enough sunlight. A lot of herbs you can grow in the shade. Uh, basil will actually grow, like I'm propagating some basil to grow and I got some here on the arrow garden I'll just take pieces of this and grow them if you're to grow them from seeds you'd start them inside cilantro parsley pretty much your herbs because believe me if you're growing nothing but potatoes and you run out of food you're gonna really wish you had some herbs or seasonings those will grow good in there you can also grow potatoes but they won't like it it's kind of like basil you can put it there but it's not gonna really blow up it'll grow but but um, potatoes, what will happen is you'll just get small little potatoes. But you'll get potatoes. I mean, it's better than nothing. So put herbs in your shady part. Oh, you can also put some blackberries. Uh, they like kind of uh, shady stuff too. Blackberries. That reminds me. I am a freak about strawberries. So strawberries are really hard to grow from seed. I've done it. It took me like two years just to get some exotic strawberries done. But the um, the easiest way is just to buy some from the store and then propagate runners. And if you know anyone that has a strawberry patch, they will be happy to give you runners because they will you'll have more than you can handle. Definitely plant strawberries. They are a wonderful bang for the buck. So I was going through my seed stash and I forgot I had, you know, I have survival seeds. And I didn't realize that they are almost, gosh, eight years old now, eight or nine years old. And these guys, now they're supposed to be, when they're sealed like this, they're supposed to be good for 20 years. But realistically, I don't think that's possible. I don't know. So what I might do next year, because unfortunately I bought this when I was living in the South. 
So I don't know how well they'd grow here. But uh, what I might do is break these things open and test it next year when it's not an emergency situation. But right now, I don't want to take the chance because this is 2011. This is so old. Uh, now, what will probably happen is, yes, there will be seeds at work, but your germination will probably be like a half or a third percent. So if you started them in trays and just did a lot of them, you'd probably be okay. These things will actually work, but you're just going to spend a lot of seeds doing it. Thanks for watching. I appreciate uh, you guys sticking with me. I have had a pretty rough time with all that's going on in the world. Uh, for you guys to know that I disappeared for a while because I was trying to start a practice. and Just like the worst time ever to start a practice. Uh, and patients have pretty much almost dropped to nothing. So I'm doing what I can just to stay afloat. So if you guys also see me sometimes carve wood art here. I'm kind of a beginner wood carver, but... If any of you guys want to buy any of this, I'm just trying to, uh, because the YouTube has completely cut my money. It's, it's dropped it for about 80% in the last two months. So with my job gone and that gone, I'm looking to do what I can to hustle just to keep things afloat. So I'm selling these wood pieces. Little stuff like this, like here's that paper moon I carved. Um, the vintage paper moon. Most of my stuff glows in the dark. So you'll see that just about every piece I sell glows in the dark. And they're almost all candlesticks at this size. Anything you fit in your hand, you will, there's a little hole in the top to, to burn a candle. And uh, you can get a better idea. There's like, you know, mushroom glow in the dark. But you'll see the hole there. You can see a little bit of me working on this guy. Anyway, um, these run about 35 bucks, And you can request I'll make something like it most of these uh, a few of these I still have for sale if you want but I don't have like an Etsy page or anything like there's a, a witch's knot that glows in the dark uh, these medium these small pieces run about 35 bucks once we jump up to medium pieces like this the medium pieces run anywhere from uh, 50 bucks up to 80 depending on how elaborate the uh, like something like this would be probably 55 bucks then something oh and he glows in the dark here's his other half but something like this where i've again a wall hanger something like this probably around 50 bucks but this guy has a protective symbol in his beard i carved in that takes a long time and that's protection against illness and disease and i actually put it in my office you'll see it in the corner there under the lamp something like that's uh about usually about 80 dollars and then you go up to the large sizes they run about a hundred dollars and they're usually wall hangers then I go up to the totems the really larger sizes and this thing has multiple faces on it it takes me a very long time there's four different faces on this thing something like this would be about 150 bucks now none of this includes shipping and we'll have to talk about shipping but if you're interested you want to help keep me afloat uh, either use the Amazon link below or consider buying a wood piece just leave a comment and I'll send you an email and we can talk and I'll make you a custom one. Lastly, I've been trying for years to get off YouTube. It's like uh, being in a relationship with an abusive spouse or something. So you will find out that I've been publishing my videos a day or two early over at BitChute and Brighton. Uh, and if you're interested, sign up over there and check it out. If not, you can wait for the videos here. I'll still put them up here. Love you guys. Thanks so much for the support.